mostly uh, starch granules, some may be protein. Mm. Um, and then after the roasting, there's a replacement of this with an amorphous um, matter which suggests that all of the starch granules have been broken down. So what you've done is you've shown very clearly that by, by roasting in that case that you have rendered the carbohydrate that's present in the food probably much more available and, and uh, I think this food would have been a very good energy supply. Having these results really allows us to model the past mm -hmm. with far greater precision than we could otherwise do. Over-reliance on any one plant could have been catastrophic in lean times such as the winter. Our ancestors would have needed a wide variety of different plant sources for each plant type to ensure their availability. The question is, which options were worth pursuing? We're going to carry out an experiment with the plant today and for that we need a pestle and mortar. What I'm doing is I'm just quickly shaping up this pestle. It, um, it's a very important tool, it's not just any old stick. It needs to have um, a, a, a real balance to it when you use it. I've used tools like this in Africa and if you get it right it's, it's easy to use, comfortable to use. I'm using a metal axe, of course. If our ancestors had uh, made pestles like this, which we're not sure about for the Mesolithic, um, it would have taken them a lot longer to shape with stone tools. But they could have achieved just the same results without any difficulty. Of that, I'm certain. Of course, materials like this tend not to survive from that period. But the plant we're looking at really needs some tools to help us to process it. But this is one of the likely candidates, and it's only by carrying out experiments that we'll gain some understanding of what may have been done. The plant we're interested in is called sea club rush. We know its roots have a high caloric content, but we need to work out how our ancestors might have processed it. And here you have the uh, under, underwater uh, roots, and within each of these bundles of root you have hard tubers. And I've, I've uh, trimmed one clear, it's about so big, the size of a, a, a biggish marble. What we need to do is strip the outer layers from the tubers without crushing the tubers themselves. The secret isn't so much in the use of the stones as in the shape of the mortar itself, and that's based on research that Gordon has carried out in the Middle East. Good way to warm up, Gordon. <laughs> it's certainly working anyhow. The, the, the roots, are, there's masses of fibres of the roots and so on. All the muck is coming off very nicely. I, I think that the secret seems to be not to hit it too hard. As I just use the weight of the pestle, starting to get more red showing now. I don't know whether you're noticing that. There's a sudden improvement in the rate of the exposure of the red and the stripping off of those the little roots. You can see that where I've been hammering them here with the pestle, there, there's actually a cycling action. The, the, the roots are going down and working their way up the edge. And around the edge of the mortar now is this, this scum, which is all the hairy bits that we've cleaned off. And you can see how it's really starting to clean them up beautifully. The colour coming through there. Some of them have split. They're very brittle tuber. The cleaning is only the start. These roots are like rocks, so they need pulverising in a flat base mortar. That's really... Uh, it's really starting to go down now, Gordon. It's an awful lot of work. It is a huge for a meal. Starch rich though it is, uh, uh, the, the, the energy costs in, in producing it are uh, considerable. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's amazing how it's bulked out there. Shall we? Uh, it's, it's twice the volume. I think we should try some. Oh, let's give it a go. Nice, there's a sweetness to it, isn't there? Yeah, and coconut texture. And there's a lot of nutty flavour. Almond. There is a sweetness to it. It's a very, mm. very mild sweetness. Mm, that's right. And there's a real cardboardness about it as well. Uh, yes, a certain chewiness to it. I mean, it really doesn't want to be eaten, does it? And there's a, there's a fibriness that... There's always something seems to be left. It doesn't want to go. That's right. It's, it's, uh, you get left with something indissolvable, indissoluble in the mouth, isn't there? 
We could have found something here, you know. This could be the answer to Willy Wonka's everlasting gobstopper. <laughs> 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 At last, the sea club brush is ready to cook. I've mixed an egg in to bind it into what's known as a damper, and I'm using a hot, flat rock heated in the fire. That's hot. That rock's real hot. That's going to cook well. As dampers go, this is quite small. When I've watched Aboriginal people cooking dampers, they're normally quite large affairs. But it's a good test. It'll be fascinating to see how the flavour has been affected by this cooking. Well, it looks about done to me, Gordon. Excellent. Yes, that that makes it hard too. That's excellent. Let's see. And there we go. Try a little bit. Thanks. Let's see what you think. That's very palatable. Yeah. And the texture's good too improved it's gone softer one gets the feeling that it's going to be a very filling food and uh, a very sustaining the, the, it's got a real chestnut quality almost like a stuffing that's what it tastes like it tastes like a stuffing i could imagine mixing that maybe with some marjoram and you could stuff a, a bird with that you just as could. we know today I and mean, it's surprising but my only problem with this food is the huge amount of effort that's required massive. to produce it a massive amount of effort and despite its high caloric content as food uh, the calories that have been expended in getting that far are great, are enormous. And so I can't see it being a, a first choice in a, as a starch staple, caloric staple in this part of the country, uh, in this part of the world, where other food plants can provide uh, the same calories uh, are available. We're learning as much from experiments that don't work as from those that do. In this area, sea club rush must have been a fallback plant an important option, but not a caloric staple. Other potential staples fare even worse. One of the sources of food we consider that our ancestors may have been using were grass seeds. But there is often a problem with the grass seeds found in Britain, and that's a fungus called ergot. You can see it here. That's the fruit body emerging from the seed. If you make bread from seed that's infected with ergot, the bread is toxic and it drives you crazy. In fact, it can kill you. But the coast does have reliable and safe foods in plenty, which is why it's believed the earliest people clung to the shoreline as they spread around the world. This is the far north of Scotland, a place we know Mesolithic Britons lived, and when they came here, they would have found one of my favorite resources, shellfish. But I tell you what, Gordon, it's one of those, it's one of those days today. And the tide's on its way out. You can see gradually the shore exposing, but the wind's blowing on shore. So there's one of these eternal battles between the tide and the wind. Is the wind a bit winning at the moment? The, the wind is holding the tide in a bit, and of course that means that we won't see so much of the beach today. All oh, right. But here it's fantastic. You know, look at all this seaweed. In amongst all of this we can find food, although at the moment we only see seaweed, but with a, with a hook stick, we should find some other foods. Look, ah, mussels. Yes. Indeed, yes, there we are. Some good-sized mussels here. Look, that's a nice one. And, of course, you wouldn't pick the really small ones. You'd let those grow on okay. and come back another day. So, I'm, not, I'm not uprooting this seaweed. I'm just pulling it out of the way so we can see what's really underneath it. As we work our way down towards the shore, they should get bigger. Some really nice sized mussels here. I like to be right on the edge of the tide going out oh, yes. because there's a chance of seeing something trying to oh, scuttle well, away. Idea, yes. um, I think it looks like a little eel. Oh, wow. oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lamp there. Yeah. Quite nice, we'll let yeah, him go back, it? he's too small to eat. But of course, as you know, in, in a lot of societies, the children, that would have been a child's meal, where perhaps further down the beach would have been Dad looking for something a little larger. In darkness, the children would have cooked it up as their own little meal at the head of the beach? Oh, yeah, I don't think they'd have missed that. Yeah, we let him go, let him go back to where he came from. 
give him a little bit of cover from the cormorants. <laughs> 